Hi, everyone, and welcome to The May Lee Show. Glad to have you here again, if you are a regular viewer or listener to the show. And if you're new, welcome. I'm, I'm so glad you're joining, and I hope you'll stick around. Um, I, this is a great episode uh, because I have a very special guest. I mean, all my guests are special. Uh, but this guest that I spoke to just very recently is none other than Shannon Lee, the daughter of the legendary, iconic Bruce Lee. And we had such a great conversation about everything from the new book that's about to come out that she wrote called um, Be Water, My Friend, The Teachings of Bruce Lee. And uh, we talked about Warrior, the show on Cinemax that she is an executive producer of. We talked about her work with the foundation. And we also just talked about her life and how it's continuing to evolve um, and what it's like to be the daughter of Bruce Lee and, and, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly uh, with all of that. So it was a great and it's a great and intimate conversation. It's very authentic. She's She's true blue, man. I mean, she, she's got nothing to hide. And, and I love the fact that she is so honest about, you know, the ups and downs of her life uh, because she certainly has been through a lot uh, up to now. Um, but her father continues to guide her, which is really, really cool. Now, usually for those of you who regularly listen and tune into my show, you know that at the top of the show, I'll riff about what's going on in the world and news and, you know, politics and things, you know, and I share my opinion, et cetera, et cetera. But this time I decided because this show with Shannon Lee is so good and I just want to keep it sort of more pure, (laughs) because there's so much crap going on in the world. Um, always, uh, particularly lately. And today is September 29th, Tuesday. And the first presidential debate is going to take place tonight. So I figured, you know what, let me hold off on talking about all that stuff that's going on until after that and add to it. Uh, and also talk about the, uh, latest news and information and investigative reporting that was, that had come out, uh, by the New York times about, uh, the man whose tax record is, uh, really quite revealing to all of us, um, because he happens to be the president of the United States. So I'm going to talk about that in another episode, um, very, very shortly after the debate and after we've processed what's, what's, uh, what, what happens tonight. So, uh, so for this episode, I just want to get right into the interview with Shannon Lee. Here we go. Shannon, so good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being with me today. Oh my gosh, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Well, you have so much going on. I've been doing all this research. I read your book that's about to come out next month called Be Water, My Friend, The Teachings of Bruce Lee. We're totally going to talk about that. Um, you have second season of Warrior coming up. You have You obviously still run the foundation. I mean... What's going on? You must be like all over the place. <laughs> I'm a little busy. I, <laughs> I, I sometimes, uh, it gets a little chaotic and I really have to focus and try to be as organized as I can. Cause there is a lot going on, but, um, I also kind of like it that way. It keeps it, you know, uh, I like a variety of things happening. I like to, you know, everything happens in its own time too. So, you know, some projects take longer to nurture, some are quicker. So it's, it's this constant flow of, of a, a bunch of different currents. That yeah. I'm- yeah. I mean, it, it is, be- uh, because I know a lot of these projects, some of them you had put on the back burner. It wasn't ready. Like for instance, warrior, right. The cinematic yeah. show that is going into its second season. Congratulations on that, by the way. I mean, Thank that's you. a project you. that your father had wanted to do. Uh, yes. but Warner brothers didn't go with, go with it. Right. At that time. Yeah, no, I, I always, I often kind of joke and say warrior it, it has been in uh, development for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, my father, you know, was, they wanted him to star in a TV show and he had also pitched this concept to them. And then they ultimately just said, uh, you know, we can't have an Asian, star of an American TV show. Right. So, right. Yeah. 
So that was the end of that. Um, yeah. I, I want to get into the story of Warrior in a little bit, but uh, it's just it's just fascinating to me that your father's legacy. And let, let's get this out of the way. Huge Bruce Lee fan. Who isn't? <laughs> But I really am. And, and you know, I mean, right. let me share with you, but the, because I grew up in the 70s in the U.S. and um, in a very white community. And so I often would be teased, as a lot of us were. And people would always be like, oh, is Bruce Lee your dad? Is he your uncle? And sometimes I'd be like, yes, he is. You know, just 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 to shut them up, right? <laughs> but it was that, what, what I when I reflect back on that, What's amazing about that really is that everybody knew who he was. Everybody yeah. knew who Bruce Lee was. Even if they didn't watch his movies or they didn't know anything else about him, they knew who he was. And that's, yeah. that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty incredible phenomenon. It's pretty incredible. And I have to say that that is true the world over. Like when I have traveled, when I've been to uh, Africa, when I've been to Europe, when I've been to the Middle East, like everybody knows who, the name Bruce Lee. Right, right, right. Yeah. For you then, I mean, I'm sure you've been asked this question, but I, I'm always curious when, you know, because you, you always uh, ask like the kids of celebrities and well-known people what it's like to grow up under the shadow or in the shadow of someone so iconic. Uh, yeah. I know in your book, you address some of that on occasion, you know, not knowing quite how to handle that. So yeah. what has been your metamorphosis uh, from childhood to now in terms of being Bruce Lee's daughter? Yeah, I have to say the most meaningful metamorphosis for me has been working on myself believing myself coming into my own because quite frankly, yes, it's true. Uh, having Bruce Lee as your father does have you end up in some interesting situations, circumstances, conversations, but really, uh, you know, the issue is more on the inside of myself, yeah. right? Like knowing who I am, feeling grounded and centered in who I am, which by the way, has been a lifelong process. Of course. And at different times in my life, I have, um, you know, felt like I was hiding something. I've experimented with not hiding it, you know, telling people just, you know, not brazenly, but like, you know, if it came up in conversation, oh, what do you do? Oh, how'd you get into that? Just telling them. And there's no right or wrong way to approach it. It just is what it is. And what I have needed to get okay with is within myself. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, Cause I would think yeah. that that would affect your own identity, not knowing yes. like, okay, is my identity because I'm Bruce Lee's daughter? Do I create my own identity? Is it related? How is it connected? How do I, you know, how do I balance that? And I would think that would be extremely challenging at times, especially during adolescence and even as an adult, you write about this in the book as well, that you still have to grapple with that constantly yeah. of people wanting a piece of you because you're Bruce Lee's daughter, things like that. And I would think that that you would have to gauge, almost be suspicious about everyone's <laughs> intentions to a certain extent, right? Yeah, definitely. And I have, I tend to be a fairly trusting person and there have been times when that has been misplaced, you know, where I'm like, Oh, this person is, you know, excited to hang out with me because uh, of me. And then it turns out that that wasn't, doesn't end up to be the case. And, right. you know, you learn over time, <laughs> of course. but in terms of identity, it, it's been a struggle because truly there are, look, I mean, I am a part of him right? Literally. Yeah. And, and also he and I meet, uh, and share a love for personal growth, for philosophy, for all of that. I've studied martial arts, but I'm not a martial artist like he was. Right. Um, but well, who was Shannon? I mean, yeah. seriously, who was <laughs> He's like the greatest ever. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, but so I, I, um, get a lot of assumptions placed on me. Yeah. I have beat myself up over not being the most physically fit human, not being as uh, fast paced in my 
accomplishments as him, you know, like he accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. And every time I like stop to like binge watch a Netflix show, there'd be a part of me that would feel guilty. Really? Yeah. You know, like you're not using your time as you're not maximizing your time, you know, and all of that. Yeah. And so this, these are things that like I have to just work on for myself right? and, and be okay with who I am and what I need as a human being and understand too. And I, I've said this in, in the past, like I have the gift of a much longer life. Yeah. So it's, it's okay. My pace is a little slower I am a different person than he is. Right. And still, I'm doing a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As we said at the top of the show, you are on fire right now. You got a lot of plates spinning in the air. But uh, but that's a really interesting yeah. point, Shannon, because you you know, a lot of a lot of people always say this, you know, he Bruce Lee died at 32, right? And it, it, ha, the amount of stuff that he did at 32 years old, it's amazing. You think about like, wow, how much more could he have done if he had lived longer? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of wonder, do you, like you're saying, you don't need to move at that pace like your father did. Do you think in some ways, I mean, he would have always moved that, that, that pace regardless, or do you think there was something internal spiritual about him where he knew that time was limited somehow in some strange way? Yeah. I mean, look, I have my own thoughts on that. I do think that, um, whether we, it's a sub, I imagine it's mostly subconscious, but we do have a sense of our internal clock, I think. And I think he came into this world on fire, essentially. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, 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 you know, he was very, um, also just so, uh, keenly aware and intelligent and driven. And, you know, the things that he would like the epiphanies he was having and the, and the things he was writing about when I read them, I mean, his whole be water, uh, thing, he was 17 when, when that happened, you know? Yeah. And, and then we have like at 21, he's writing letters about, you know, this, sense of energy he has inside of him, this dynamic power that he holds in his hands and all of this stuff at 21. And, you know, and that he didn't, you know, look, when we're young, we may have a sense of that. Cause I know when I was young, I was probably a little bit more energetic than I am now, Yeah. but, but we tend to sort of like take it for granted. And, and he did not do that. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, he was definitely going at a pace and I, I do personally feel like we have a sense for our internal clock and, um, and so, but you know, that's, how do you prove that? Right. (laughs) Yeah, no, you you can't. And I, and I asked because uh, of his intensity, it seemed like he was always intense. He was, he was never somebody who would relax. You write in the book at one point, and this has been talked about before where, he would never stand still. If he was like waiting for something, he would drop down and do push-ups, or he would always take the stairs or he would always be, be very active and very conscious of his yeah. actions, his behavior, and always sort of seeking to improve himself in, in whatever time he had available. And so that is a very unique character. Very unique. Yeah. And it's so funny because I'll tell you this just funny story. We have this picture of my dad and he's in his pajamas and he's like got his head in his hand, like cocked to the side and his mouth kind of hanging over like he's dead asleep. (laughs) And for the longest time when I was a kid, I was like, this is my favorite picture because (laughs) this is him like, you know, acting like the rest of us, like (laughs) dead, dead asleep, (laughs) you know, like exhausted, dead asleep. And then one day I said to my mom, I said, oh, I just love that picture of dad where he, and she said, oh, he, that was just a joke. He, oh, no. <laughs> she's like, we took that picture as a joke. That's not okay, real. That's hilarious. So he was making fun of himself. That that's funny. That is funny. <laughs> well, um, so, you know, uh, I have to go back to the comment. You said he, he was born, you know, like on fire. Right. Yeah. And I know in the book you mentioned, um, that I guess he was all fire. Um, his signs and all of his elements were fire. I am too. 
And so uh, I, I, I'm all five of my pillars, according to a Korean astrologist, he was saying I'm all fire. So when I read that, I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'm like Bruce <laughs> Lee, but, but it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah. all the more sense why water was something that he would talk about and the flow of water and the element that of water and the characteristics of water. Yes. So that is what everybody knows about Bruce Lee, his famous quote about mm -hmm. being like water. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me when you, obviously he, you were only four when he passed. Yeah. Um, when did it start occurring to you that he was this man who had such deep thoughts, philosophical thoughts? Was that, was that much later in, in your life that you started realizing this? Uh, I guess in an intellectual sense, yes. But, um, you know, I grew up always having a sense of my father. Um, and then, you know, I remember, you know, in the seventies, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do was published posthumously. Um, and there are a lot of philosophical, uh, uh, writings within that book as well. And I remember, you know, my mom just sort of always mentioning some of the more famous quotes that were personal to him, like be water or walk on or using no way is way having no limitations limitation, because that was the, the tenet of his art and his life, you know? Right. And so, and so I knew these things. Uh, I probably didn't know them that strongly until I was older, right? Like probably high middle school, high school, I started to know it intellectually a little bit more. But it really wasn't until my 20s that, that I really dove into his writings. Mm. And his writings, yeah. he was prolific. I mean, uh, I watched the Be Water documentary that uh, mm. Bao Yuan did, which was incredible. Um, yeah. That was such a insightful look at the whole life of Bruce Lee and, and your dad's journey and the influence yeah. that he had. And I thought I was very, very moved by what he represented when it came to equality and representation and, um, you know, trying yes. to, trying to cross the color barrier, uh, because he himself, right. He himself yeah. had been dealing with that all his life of not really having a sense of belonging. He wasn't Chinese enough because he was a quarter Caucasian, but then right. he was two Chinese here in America. And so he was right. always, he always felt like he was the other or the outsider. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And therefore that really shaped his behavior as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, people have asked me, where do you think that sense of equality came from? And I just, I just have to say, like, I think that he understood innately that, that from a human perspective, we all are the same. We, you know, not just biologically, but, but we all struggle with the same things internally, you know, yeah. um, the things that we want, um, our own doubts, our own fears, our own, uh, concerns. Right. And, and I think he understood that. And I, and I think, you know, growing up at being born in the United States, growing up in, you know, Japanese occupied Hong Kong as a child during, uh, world war two, and then Hong Kong being a British colony and then his own run-ins with, um, the police and with, um, uh, gangs and even within his own school, he was kicked out, um, for being a quarter Caucasian, right. uh, after a while and, you know, just on and on and marrying a Caucasian woman, having biracial children, like it just goes on and on throughout his life. And I just think he felt this is silly. Like, what? Yeah. like I'm, I'm a human just like everyone else. Like, why are we treating each other this way? And, and not only that, but, but, you know, he wanted, I mean, so from a, hu from a human perspective, he believed in our one human family, but he also believed that we should be celebrating each other's cultural identities and cultural differences. And he wanted people to understand, you know, an authentic portrayal of a Chinese man, right. you know, which was why he struggled for representation so much. Yeah. So, you know, he, he definitely, I think, because of all of those things and because he could perceive energetically this sense within himself. And he was like, well, if this is in me, it must be in all people. Mm, 
Yeah. You know, he, 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 he wanted to see that in all people. Yes. Right. Yes. And that's why his, you know, philosophy and his writings reflect that idea of yes. non-judgment and openness and yes. emptying your mind like the teacup. Right. Okay. Yeah. And yes. To be able to absorb, you know, what's around you. Um, right. And so, yeah. So let's talk about the book because you, you cover all of these aspects in the book so beautifully. And I love the fact that you are weaving, you know, things that he wrote and things he said throughout the book um, mm -hmm. to affirm, you know, what, what he was, uh, what he was all about. Right. Tell me why, first and foremost, you decided to write this book. Again, it's called Be Water, My Friend, The Teachings of Bruce Lee. Yeah. Um, so this book sort of birthed itself in a weird way. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a podcast also called the Bruce Lee podcast where I have had been uh, talking about my father's philosophies for a while. It's, it's, you know, an applied philosophy podcast, which is a bit of a niche okay. uh, <laughs> okay. sub subject matter, but, um, but it was about, you know, his philosophies are the thing that always resonated deeply with me. Yeah. And so I, and I want people to know this side of him. I want them to understand that the reason they're so wowed by him when they see him uh, move or, you know, do his martial arts or any of that is because he worked so deeply on himself mm -hmm. and tried to live his life in a particular way and up to a particular, you know, st uh, standard of fulfilling his own potential. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I was doing this podcast and, uh, with my co-host Sharon Lee, and we were breaking down his philosophies and occasionally having guests and things like that. And, um, there was a literary agent who reached out and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? Hmm. And the interesting thing is I do love to write and I had always wanted to write a book, but I had just never quite landed on exactly about what. Yeah. And so I had a conversation with him and he said, well, let's, let's see, you know, if we can do, you know, make put together a proposal and see if there's anyone interested and lo and behold and and the and the rest is sort of um history but i'm so grateful really for for that opportunity that that this sort of got called in and i was able to fulfill a dream of writing a book and yeah. and i really enjoyed the process and it's one that i would love to continue to do well i could tell when reading this book that you were sharing not only just your father's teachings, but you were also sharing how it's affected you and how you've applied it to your life and you're still applying it to your life. And you're still, like you said, in the beginning of this interview, you're, you're still in process. You're still on a journey of s discovering yourself and your identity and all of that. Uh, totally. so tell me when you were writing this book and going through his writings and his teachings, what, what happened with you? did you go on an, a journey yourself and do a lot of self-discovery as well? Oh my gosh. So much. It's so interesting to me that my father's words, when I have really sat deeply with them at different times in my life, it has helped me. Mm. Like it, it has healed me and helped me go to the next level with whatever I'm struggling with. I talk in the book about how that was the case around the death of my brother and it was also the case uh, with this writing of this book, like really sitting with his words and sitting in deep contemplation and, and how to express these concepts in as plain and accessible a way, yet meaningful way as possible, which was my goal. And um, I was also at the same time going through a lot in my personal life, a lot of changes, um, changes with my business, changes uh, with my own growth. And I grew, I was so grateful that I had the time that I had to write this book because I feel like with each draft, I was like, oh wait, I have grown over yeah. these last, last few months. And now I know how to say this in an even better way. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. you were going yeah. through your own transformation as you were writing about these things that are helping other people transform. So, I mean, let's <laughs> exactly. put it this way. This book is not a, it's, it's not a biography. It, it's literally a book that's teaching 
you know, whoever reads it, it's, it's a yeah. way that, you know, you're teaching people, this is, this is what my fa father followed and believed, and these are his writings, and this is how you can apply it to your life. So it really mm -hmm. is something that actually people can use to for self-improvement, self-awareness, self-reflection, all of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, uh, and hopefully it's an enjoyable book to read as well. And there are a lot of stories about my father's life and yeah. my own life as well. But for me, like his words, his teachings have been, as I said, super healing yep. to me and have helped me to grow. And I'm just like, well, if this helps me, it can help a lot of people. And so I just wanted to give people access to it. Yeah. I mean, like I, I said to you before we started this interview, I, I, I think I highlighted like half this book because <laughs> everything I was like, wow, that's really good too. And be, again, because it's, it's you, it's you making, um, a lot of what he said a little bit more palpable and understandable. Um, and yeah. it's, it's sort of more explained, um, yeah. but then also his own words are so powerful. He was a beautiful writer, wasn't he? Oh, beautiful. I mean, really? Just so poetic, like, yes. you know, and, and that's part of like, that's why I felt like there's a little bit of explanation that's needed because like with most poetry, you know, uh, it, it sometimes needs a little interpretation. Yeah. And, and so his, um, um, words are like poetry. They read very beautifully, but I also felt like, well, and I just want people to fully understand and grasp what the, this is. So I'm going to kind of put it in really plain layman's terms. Right. You know, right. Yeah, exactly. Because if you just say, you know, he talked about an empty cup, you know, uh, right. people would be like, what, what, <laughs> what is he talking about? But I like the fact that right. you elaborated on it and then use real life, real life examples to say, this is what he meant by this. Um, and I think right. that's very useful. So very good job, Shannon. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's, let's talk about you do. Yes. You do write about certain things, uh, that your father went through, um, including mm -hmm. making enter the dragon. I had no idea that he was in a standoff with, uh, the studio about yeah. how the, okay. So let's explain. Enter the Dragon, he was making this movie and he was very excited and they were all ready to shoot. They started shooting, but he realized that the screenplay that he had worked on to make it more authentic, mm -hmm. the studio was like, nah, you know, and, and didn't make any of the changes he wanted. So he literally was in a standoff with the studio. He refused to shoot for what, yeah. weeks on end, something like that, right? Yeah, for for at least two weeks. He, he uh, you know, had been, he understood that this was his, a, a really big opportunity for him yeah. to finally be a, an Asian star in a Hollywood film and to bring his authentic uh, nature to this project. Right. And so, yes, you know, it's an action film and, and all of that, but he was like, I've got to find a way to put as much of, you know, this uh, authentic sense of my martial art and my philosophy and my culture into this project as much as possible. And he really didn't care for the script. Yeah. So he worked on it day and night and put in all these great scenes. And, and he said, this is the, this is the project I want to shoot. And the, and the, um, studio sort of was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And yeah. then day one, he's supposed to show up on set and he gets a shooting script and they haven't put any of it in. And so he just refused to come to set. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. And, he's, and the star, I, he's the star of the movie. He's got to show up at some time, but good for him. He really yeah. took a stand and he's like, no, I'm not going to do this until yeah. you change it back to what I wanted. Well, and I said to my mom, you know, when, when we were talking about this, cause she was like holed up with him in our house in Hong Kong and the producers would come and try to talk to him and she would have to act as a go between. And, and I said, was he really willing to lose this opportunity? Like, was he really like, if you don't put this in, I am not doing this film. And she said, absolutely. Wow. Wow. And I really, you know, and I make this point in the book, I really think he was so, uh, sh he, he tr believed in himself, which yeah. is something that I think all of us struggle with to a, a certain extent. Right. And he believed in himself and he knew, understood the situation and, and he was 
because of all of this self-work that he had done, knowing himself, practicing, studying, understanding what he was going for, um, that he was able to make this stand. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, a lot of us, you know, when we get a job, we go, oh, well, it's not the best job, but maybe it'll lead to a better job. And we kind of make compromises like that. And yep. not that there's anything wrong with that. But for him, he was like, you know, I only get introduced to Hollywood once. Yeah. <laughs> and he, so he wanted to, yeah. to take full advantage of that opportunity. Well, you know what it's yeah. called? It's called true conviction. He was, yeah. he had true conviction in this project in himself and he s was standing on principle yeah. uh, and something that, you know, we, he 100% obviously believed in. So that says a lot about your dad because, you know, conviction, we can talk, you know, a big talk about it, but most people will not stand by that conviction yeah. and sacrifice everything perhaps, yeah. right? Totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look what it resulted in. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And all those scenes in the film, like, um, the art of fighting without fighting and the finger pointing at the moon and it hits by all, it, it hits all by itself. And all of those great, like philosophical bits and pieces that really give the film its like weight yes. and beauty. Yes. Um, those were his scenes. Don't think feel it is like a finger pointing away to the moon don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory that was all him right yeah yeah, yeah. so so again in the book you talk about how your father was so committed to truly finding that authenticity and yes. finding who he is 100% rather than being uh, distracted or affected by outside forces. He was, he constantly was doing that internal work. Yes. And, and, and you said something uh, just a minute ago, which I think is so important is that he also, he didn't just write things and talk about things. He did them. Yeah. Right. And that is, uh, a huge difference. You know, a lot of people, and he, he would write about this a lot. He said, a lot of people will talk uh, about a lot of things, but they will never get to the heart of the matter and they will never act on it. Right. And, and he said, you know, quite frankly, even though I love philosophy, philosophy itself can be the disease for which it pretends to be the cure. Mm -hmm. So it's like, philosophizing about life and having all these deep thoughts about how life should be is great. But if all you ever do is think about it, talk about it, yeah. but don't apply it. Totally. Shannon. I always say you can talk the talk, but you got to walk yeah. the walk. You know, totally. I don't care how much you talk about these social issues and social injustice and race. You better walk the walk too then. Right. Or That's else right. It's, 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 then it's meaningless. Right. It's meaningless. And look, it's scary to walk the walk. There's always that moment where you're like, oof, okay, I have to step into this thing that I said I was going to step into that I said I believed in. Right. And look, it's uncomfortable and all of that. But, but these are the things that lead to our levels of growth and for us really discovering ourselves. Right. That, that's what I feel. Yeah. And again, it's so amazing that your father accomplished all of this and found that self-awareness and that <laughs> conviction uh, by the age of 32. It probably right. before that, it was probably before that. Yeah. Yeah. But he had yeah. reached, reached that point of almost enlightenment, right? You know, if you're talking about it from a Buddhist sense. Um, but, uh, that, that is again, pretty extraordinary. Um, Shannon, you also write about your brother in the book mm -hmm. and, um, uh, mm -hmm. most of us know if we were familiar with your family and, and your, um, and all the things that has, have happened to your family, your brother, Brandon, uh, unfortunately, 1993, died, um, very unexpectedly on set when he was shooting the crow. Correct. Um, what I found extraordinary is that you write about, um, getting on a plane to, was it North Carolina? That's where he was shooting, right? And yes. at one point, uh, during the trip, you said you felt a bolt of energy or something going through your body. And at that moment you knew that your brother had died. Can you describe that? 
moment for me and and then you know obviously the loss of your brother yeah um i mean it's 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 challenging to describe all i can say is we were my mom and i were on the plane we had met in i believe atlanta um because she was flying from california and i was flying from new orleans we met up there and then we flew on to wilmington north carolina and we couldn't sit together because these were last minute flights and I was sitting on the plane. And of course, you know, we had kept hearing updates like, Oh, and they, they weren't sounding good, but we really they didn't know, yeah. you know, how badly injured he was or any of that sort of thing. So we just knew that there'd been an accident and that he was in the hospital and that they were, you know, doing surgery and, and all this kind of stuff. And I was flying along, you know, in a state of, anxiety. And I just felt this, I, I, I don't know how to describe it other than there was like this pure bolt of energy that like flew up from below and like up through my body and out the top of my head. And it was really fast. Mm. And I just burst into tears. And I was like, I, I, the only thing my, I could really think at the time was, oh, I, I think that was my brother's spirit, like leaving his body. Wow. That's, that's what it felt like to right, me. Right. And then of course, and so then I'm crying on the plane and like, you're sitting around all these people and I'm, so I'm like trying not to, yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to cover it up, trying to like face the window and all that sort of stuff. And I, and then I, and then, you know, as we do, you're like, oh, you know, but like, uh, how would you know what that, you're being, you're just having a panic attack. It's okay. That's not what it is. It's not what it is. And you kind of soothe yourself and talk yourself into believing something else. And then of course, when we landed, we found out he had died. Right. So, yeah. Were you, were you close to your brother? I was, you know, interestingly, we, we didn't live in the same place because he was four years older than me. So like, as I'm coming into high school, he's graduating high school. Mm. And then he only went to college for a semester and then he immediately got into his acting career. And then, you know, I'm in college in new Orleans at Tulane university and he's in Hollywood pursuing his acting career. But, you know, so I, 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 I don't think we got to spend as much time together in our adult life as right. we would have liked. Right. That, that said, when we would see each other, he would confide in me, you know, we would, we would talk and, you know, he was killed um, just a, a couple weeks before his wedding. Oh, oh, and, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. geez. Okay. And uh, he had asked me to be his best man at his wedding. Oh, <laughs> best oh. man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I and I I worked. I was his personal assistant on his film Rapid Fire. So, like, we had these moments, these really special moments. Actually, yeah. we weren't around each other a lot as adults, but I think we were moving in the direction of, of being able to spend more and more time together. And I think we had, we definitely had a very, um, um, connected relationship. Yeah. 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 What, uh, and I ask you this and I'll preface it with this. It, my father, a lot of my listeners and viewers know he was, uh, unexpectedly killed, um, nine years ago. And so, you know, that kind of grief when someone's taken, unexpectedly, yeah. it's very, very different. And it's a very different process you have to go through. Um, and you still yeah. go through, like, I, I mean, on that, that process will never end. Um, right. so for you at four, you lose your father, but you're very young, but you obviously have had to live with that. Um, but then to lose your brother, uh, when you're obviously old enough, aware enough, uh, to, to go through that kind of unexpected loss. Tell me how that has changed you or your outlook or your perspective, um, on, on your own life? Yeah. Um, you know, because I was, uh, my brother died right before my 24th birthday and because I was older and more aware, it was so much more painful for me at the same time. It was quite an eye opener because, um, it, it actually helped me over time to deal with my father's death and to understand that I had actually been mildly depressed most of my life. 
Um, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned the film Be Water, the ESPN 30 for 30 that Bao Win did. Um, there's a lot of footage in the, that film toward the end of the funeral in Hong Kong. Yep. And I'm just looking at my toddler self yeah. in that situation. And I am so shut down and checked out out. Like you can just tell, like when you (laughs) look at my face, I am like, you don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. And I am bewildered and in shock and just checked out, not there. Because we should describe it was chaotic because all the fans were out and they were uh, hordes of people crowding around you, your mom, your brother, and people are trying to keep them at bay. I mean, it was chaos. Yeah. Yeah. And it's July in Hong Kong. So it's like, hot, yeah. humid and Sticky. sweaty. And yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> the whole thing was a mess. And it was really interesting for me to see myself because, uh, I, I was like, Oh, like that thing, that checked out thing is what I've been trying to overcome and heal my whole life. Wow. And, um, what I would say about having to deal with this, this kind of sudden trauma that happens, which you are familiar with too, is that, um, first of all, it's so shocking and the grief is so acute. I mean, it's the worst kind of pain that I've ever felt in my life. And you think, how is the world still spinning like how are people still going to their jobs like don't they understand that that the whole world has my whole world has Has collapsed you know yeah 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 absolutely and and I don't know about you but over time I I just was like I can't live like this like I really can't live like this like I have to figure out a way to deal with this or I'm not going to make it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know what you mean. Yep. Yep. And even, and even though you're going through life, like you're going through the motions, you know, like I was trying to have an acting career of all things during that time, which is crazy and probably why it didn't work out so well. (laughs) Um, struggling against that shutdown feeling that all, all the time. And I guess what I have to say is that for me anyway, when you've dealt with something like, like this, that death is, um, sudden tragic death, uh, and any kind of death really is such a good teacher about life. Yes. Without a doubt. Yeah. Like it's suddenly life is, takes on an entirely different meaning (laughs) and you start to understand. It's, It's fleeting. Yeah. 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 That it's fleeting and that, and things come sharply into focus, you know, like the people, the relationships that are, are important, the, you know, not giving yourself over to materialistic things and like really cherishing your own journey. And even understanding that like life is going to have a lot of pain. It's going to have a lot of ups and downs. And that's, part of it, you know, like, and being able to learn how to be okay yes. in the midst of these crazy storms that happen and it, continue to happen. And using it to try to using. shape your life in a different direction, perhaps maybe it's telling you need to go into, and you write about that as well in your book, according to your father's philosophy as well, is that sometimes yeah. pain, you know, is a way that teaches us something yeah. new or different or a course correction, whatever that might be. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Th- I can say that for myself as well. And it did, it did affect me deeply, but it also had a profound effect on me in many, many ways that have now eventually turned into something positive. Uh, yes. So, but that's the decision. We have those choices to make, you know, we could either go down that dark road, which I chose to do for a little while. And oh, I think you yeah, did too. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like you said, when I read that part about you, you, you saying, I can't continue living this way, I completely related to it. I got to that point. I was like, I can, if I keep living like this, I'm not going to make it. So I, I totally understand what you were going through for sure. Oh, 
well, I'm sorry that you understand it. And I'm, and I'm grateful that you understand it. You and know, you know what? And I'm grateful that we can talk about it. So others who may be going through it can yeah. understand that they're not alone, that this is yeah. what happens, but you know, you can, you can pick yourself up, you know, with, with support, obviously, and yeah. get through it. And it does take time time and you have to process those feelings and sit with those feelings. And like you said, you know, I would, sometimes I would just sit on my couch all day. Like I, I couldn't move off this, off of the couch. Yep. I couldn't even get up to make food. I couldn't do anything, you yeah. know? And then the next day I'd be like going on an audition <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just like and truly acting like, because you, yeah, I mean, you yeah. had to be really acting at that point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And just, ugh. and so, but, but it takes time and it is a choice and the help is out there. Right. You know, I, I make a point in this book. It's like, look, I hope people pick up this book. I hope it's helpful for them, but whatever you're going through, if this book isn't helpful, there are so many tools out yeah. there in the world. There are exactly. so many and, and I'm so grateful for all the voices out there who are trying to, you know, give people access to something more to consider for themselves, because right. you never know when a message is going to resonate with someone. You, two people can be saying exactly the same thing. And for whatever reason, in that moment, in that time totally. with that person. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what I, what I found interesting about this overall um, message in the book is that it Cont completely relates to what we're going through right now in terms of mm -hmm. COVID and quarantining and the unknown and fear, judgment, mm -hmm. you know, panic, all of these things. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder like, you know, f the lessons in this book, um, how they can apply in your mind, how can they can apply to what's going on now? Because I saw so many different parallels um, yeah. of, of what's happening now. My father said, and, and I've spoken about this with regards to quarantine anyway, that in isolation, you're actually least alone because you're with yourself. Mm. <laughs> but some people don't like to, they, they don't like themselves. They don't want to be alone. <laughs> and and, well, and right. I'm all ser serious as I am saying this, because when, when people are forced to look at themselves, they don't like what they see. Well, right. And this is my point. Like, this is the time to look because yes. you are with yourself. Yes. You know, and, and you don't have as much, you know, you have distraction from the news and all of that. But once the news is off, like, you know, the thing, the thing is, is that if you can create a safe haven within yourself, then you get to take that safe haven with you wherever you go. Right. And the more that you cultivate inner strength, the more you are able to deal with these rapid changes, these rapid circumstances that are challenging. Right. Any adversity. You know, yeah, absolutely. You have that extra exactly. bit of confidence because you know yourself and you, you right. know your own strength. Listen, Shannon, from the beginning of uh, COVID, I've been saying to people, um, I hope that people take this time where we are being forced to stay at home, yes. forced in isolation, to really strip away all the other bullshit, right? And all the distractions and all the layers that we cover ourselves with and start really mm -hmm. looking at ourselves and our priorities and maybe yeah. have to reprioritize in terms of, yeah. okay, what's really important and what is all this stuff that I should just let go of? And it's the letting go that's hard. Right. It's definitely, it's hard to let go. And also, you know, I think the important thing is that, um, you know, I talk about this a lot in the book. My father talked about this a lot. It's really not what's happening. That's the issue. It's what is your reaction to it? Mm, yeah. Where, where does your mind take you? Right. Because all, all of these things is your mind taking you somewhere. So you really need to work on training your mind yep. to be positive, to be uh, resilient, to be uh, strong. To, when you start to go down a, a negative path, to go yeah. like, oh, okay, I'm not going to go down that negative path. I'm going to go over here instead. Right. Right. And, and it's a practice. It's, yeah. it's the same as digging a ditch. You know, it's like, oh, I'm so tired. I don't want to shovel another you know, and then you're like, yeah. well, but I need to, you know, plant this thing or I need to put this post here. So I have to keep going. Right. You right. know, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is, it is training. And just like, you know, your father was yeah. consistently and constantly doing that uh, with himself. Yeah. Yeah. And I talk about how my father, you know, obviously was immensely physically fit, Yeah, but he was mentally fit also. Right. And he ch- trained his mind as diligently as his body. Right. Did your dad have yeah. like 0% body fat or something like that? I mean, like <laughs> seriously, I watch his movies and I'm like, that guy has zero, n- n- zero fat. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Pretty much, pretty much. I yeah. know. <laughs> um, so tell me about, I, I, what, I love this story of the dragonfly that's related mm. to your brother. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So t- tell me that, well, tell the viewers, I know, I know this story because I read the book, but um, yeah, tell us <laughs> that story of the dragonfly and the significance of the dragonfly. I was in this really dark place um, around my brother's death. And I had happened upon, I had been given some of my father's writings and in them, I had started to find some inspiration to try to heal myself, to try to get past the grief in as proactive a way as possible. And so I started seeking, I started reading books. I started going to different healers. I, went into therapy, I, you know, just all the different modalities. And, you know, you don't have to believe in, you know, energy work or that kind of stuff, whatever you feel drawn to, yeah. you know, I, I just say, go on that path and see where it leads. Right. But, um, and so I had just started really seeking, really trying to heal myself. And I was working with this woman who was, um, a native American or indigenous persons, um, um, healer okay, and a medicine woman. And so we had been in conversation and, and I'd done a couple sessions with her and I came out of my house one day and I had been in just so much grief, trying to rid myself of this grief uh, or heal it in some way, I should say. And cause it's always there, but learn how to live with the grief is I guess what I would say. Right. And I walked out And on the ground, right in front of my door was this dragonfly and it was huge. It was bright red. Oh, wow. And it had, it had a wingspan of probably like five or six inches. Wow. That's big. It was gigantic. (laughs) (laughs) And it had just flown there in front of my door, landed on the ground and died. (gasps) No way. (laughs) Yeah perfectly intact. Oh, I didn't realize it had died. Oh my gosh. Okay. Just in front of your door. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. And, and so when you first see something like that, Oh my God, look at this dragonfly. And then, and I'm looking at it. It's not moving. It's not moving. And so I reached down and reached down and I picked it up. It was not alive. And I like held it in my hand and I was like, this is a sign. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what this, I don't know what this means, but right. like a dragonfly, just, de- just giant red dragonfly yeah. just, just delivered itself to my doorstep and died, you know? And it was in front of my, in front of my car door, I should say, which was right outside my, my house. And so as I was walking out, it was just right there. Yeah. And so I, I called this woman, the, this woman, Sarah, um, Urquidas, and I said, um, this is the healer the healer. Yeah. And I said, I just walked out my door and there was this, j-. and I said, and it's not alive, but you know, I, I have this dragonfly. And she said, dragonfly is a sign of rebirth. It's a sign of a new cycle. Um, and the fact that it's not alive feels to me like it's a message from the spirit world yeah. telling you it's time, it's time to move on. It's wow. time to heal. And did it strike you? I mean, did you, did you, were you like, you know what? I think she's right. Did you feel it? It just, it felt so meaningful to me. And I just, and I heard those words and I knew what I had been trying to heal in myself. And I just said, okay, like in a way it was a message from, I believe, you know, like my, my brother and my father just saying, it's okay. Mm. Like we're, we're okay. And we want you to be okay also. Yeah. 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 I see. I think that's beautiful because I do think we get messages. 
um, from yeah. our loved ones. Um, I've gotten yeah. messages from my dad for sure via hummingbirds. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah. Now, so yeah. because that struck you so much, you got a dragonfly tattoo, right? Yes, I have a dragonfly, big red dragonfly tattoo on, okay. <laughs> <laughs> on my back, yeah. um, a, 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 along with a number of other symbols. It was about that time that I started to think, you know, I mean, tattoos aren't for everyone, but I had always sort of wanted a tattoo, but I didn't know what to have a tattoo of. Yeah. And and that the dragonfly was the first sort of symbol that came to me. And then over the next several years, there were just a number of more meaningful signs and symbols that I started to encounter that meant a lot to me. And I, and I sort of pulled them all together and made this one design out oh, of it. Nice. And, um, and I have that tattooed on my back. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got a tattoo too. And it was a very significant symbolic tattoo. I didn't just get it willy nilly because I was drunk. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. um, so yeah, w- won't do that. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you about your mom, uh, because okay. again, Bruce Lee is such a huge name, iconic that everybody focuses on Bruce Lee, but you know, your mom was involved in his life and during crucial moments. And she sure. obviously, you know, brought you into the world as well. And your brother, um, so your mom, I, I just find fascinating because what a strong woman to have gone through everything she did, um, pre, during, and after, you know, your father's death. And for, a, again, a Caucasian woman marrying a Chinese American man during that time, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just wonder, like, you know, describe your mother to me because I just find her story and her perspective is probably fascinating. Yeah. My mom, uh, is, is, and was, I think just such an amazing partner, like such an amazing life partner. She has such um, an uh, adventurous spirit. Like she is, she's, she's game. You know oh, what I mean? So it's <laughs> like, Oh, you want to move here? Great. Let's do it. Oh, right. you want to do this? Okay, great. Let's do it. And I think she was, I know my father relied a lot on her to talk through a lot of the things that were, they were struggling with together and they struggled, you know, they yeah. didn't have any money and, <laughs> right. and, and it was really hard. And, um, and she was just such a, she, she, she is so caring. Like she knows how to give care of my father, of us kids. Mm. Um, and, um, so, so resilient, you know, and, and, you know, I don't know if people probably know this, but my fa- my mother lost her father at the age of five. Oh, really? And then she lost her husband and then she lost her son. Oh, you know, God. I mean, it's like, it's so much. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's almost too much. Yeah. It's too much. Yeah. And she continues to go on, live life fully. She's so active. She's so healthy. She's so engaged. And yes, I mean, she's been through a lot of grief in her life, but it's, as we spoke earlier, it's also taught her about life, about living your life. Yeah. And she was just, um, a wonderful, uh, strong support to my father. And, uh, you know, and it was hard on her, especially when they lived in Hong Kong, it was very hard because, um, you know, a lot of people didn't know this because my mom has blonde hair and blue eyes. Yeah. You know, she's total all American <laughs> looking girl, all American looking. And, um, but she spoke Cantonese fluently and people didn't know. Right. So they would so, like try to think they were talking behind her back, but she'd be like, I understand everything you're saying. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that had to be a little tough hearing what people were saying about her. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, really terrible. And, you know, she knew who, you know, again, like she knew who she was. She, she, she had faith in, in our family and all the struggles, you know, that they faced over time they were facing together. Yeah. How is, how do you think she's gotten through all of this then? I mean, she must be an incredibly strong person, but I feel like that's just, you know, not enough to be said, just saying that. I mean, what do you think it is about your mom that has gotten through her? through her, through all of this? 
Yeah. I mean, I know she has definitely also done her own amount of, you know, therapy and, you know, her own tools that she's employed. I think she has, um, a tremendous support. You know, she, she is remarried. She remarried in 1991. Um, and, uh, he's a terrific support to her. Um, so I was so grateful that she had him when my brother, uh, was killed right. and, you know, and, and she has many friends and I think it's hard. Look, I'm sure there are demons she still struggles with mm. as we all have. We all have yep. And I think she just has always been a person, um, you know, her mother was also a very strong person, strong personality. And I think there was always this sense of like, you just keep going, yeah. you know, yep. you just, you just keep going. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, uh, she was able to get through it. Um, uh, yeah. you know, in, in light of all the tr- tragedy that she's faced. Um, and, yeah. y- and she is, where is she right now? So she lives in Idaho, actually in Boise, Idaho. She's lived there for, you know, uh, 27 years. And uh, she moved from LA uh, shortly after, uh, well, I guess, right, right when they were married. So almost 30 years, they she's lived in Idaho. And um, she was actually just here. She she was here. She just left yesterday. Oh, wow. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Oh, and so obviously, she's healthy and traveling and she's good. Okay, good. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, she was like, I haven't, she was like, I can't take it any longer. It's been too long. I have not seen you all year. Oh, I'm coming. Okay. I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? And she's just like, I'm coming. Oh. You can't stop me. <laughs> I know. I think we're all feeling that way. And hey, they say that being on the plane is actually s- safer than being elsewhere because of all the new filtration systems they put in. So I, I don't know. I get, but that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Yeah. So. I think we're all feeling a little antsy, but, um, okay, finally, Shannon, before I let you go, so let's just talk about warrior really quickly. It's, yeah. it's second season. So good. For, I mean, it's get, gotten great reviews. Season one got great reviews. Were you nervous about this project just because there was so much on the line? And like you said, it's 50 years in the making, but then <laughs> Justin Lin jumped in on this project. And yeah. I mean, talk about like having an amazing director and executive producer to be working with you on this. Yeah. I mean, really, I have to say it was because of Justin that this project got made. Um, he He's the one who said to me, you know, hey, I've always heard this story about this treatment that your father wrote. Is, is it a true story? And I said, oh, yeah, I have it right here. He was yeah. like, oh, my God. At, you know, would you want to make it? And I said, I've always wanted to make it. But, you know, I I needed him um, to, to be on board and not, not just be on board because there are a lot of people I'm sure I could have gone to that would have said, okay, great. Yeah, let's do it. But he was a real partner. Yeah. And, and he understood, uh, uh, the, the potential and also sort of the, the, uh, the, the weight and, and significance of the project. I was just going to say the significance of what this meant. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, you know, I, we should only do this if we do it right. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, you know, hallelujah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you obviously were happy with the results. I am. I'm really happy with the result. Um, I think that the show brilliantly stands on its own while at the same time capturing my father's spirit and energy and his intention for the project. Yeah. Um, obviously in a 21st century sort of way, but, um, all of the people involved, uh, just, we, we just all got along and flowed together and were so creative, um, together. Mm. There was such camaraderie amongst the cast and the crew and everybody. That's it was such a warm feeling, which I know, know is not always the case. I was just going <laughs> to say that's kind of unique, you know, that yeah. is kind of unique. So clearly your father's like, has a hand in this still. And you just said flow, yeah. which is perfect yeah. because you know, that's about water. <laughs> you know, you want everything to flow properly. Yeah. I mean, Oprah yeah. talks about that too. She talks about flowing. Um, yeah. you gotta be in that groove and you gotta let things flow. And so it's, it's great that that project is reflecting exactly his philosophy. 
<laughs> it, it is. It is. And the second season debuts August, I mean, October 2nd okay. on Cinemax. But, you know, it's funny because because, you know, there'd been a lot of shakeup with Cinemax and HBO and HBO Max and all of the Cinemax original programming was canceled. And so then we were like, oh, no, our show is 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 getting caught up in all of this. And there's just such love for the show that it now after the show airs on Cinemax, they're going to put it on the HBO platform. Oh, and great. we can only hope that, you know. Uh, somehow, some way, they'll be able to bring it back for further seasons because we kind of, we, you know, we'll, we will see. But the show is, the second season is just even better than the first, I oh, have great. to say. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. sure our fans are like waiting on the edge of their seats to, to take a look. So congratulations yeah. on that project. And I'm sure Thank your father you. would be proud. Well, let me ask you one last question then, Shannon. Yeah. Um, if, if your father uh, seeing everything that you're up to, but then seeing the state of the world and what's going on, what do you think your father would be saying right now about this current state of affairs and, um, from his perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, we talked, we talk in, the, I talk in the book a lot and we've talked already about this, this notion of non-judgment of not, of, of trying to stay away from polarization. Yeah. You're right. I'm wrong. You win, you lose, yep. you know? Um, and we are in such a moment of that right now Completely. where like we can't even just allow one another to live and occupy space. Yeah. Like it's, it's really, um, unfortunate. And, um, I think that, you know, he, he would be, I think, uh, disappointed in that aspect, but also hoping, I think, that once we see where all of this divisiveness actually goes and, the, and we're seeing the effects of it now, like the kind of world that we end up in, right. I'm hoping and remain hopeful that at some point, just like you and I were talking about with our grief, you just have to say, it can't, I can't live like this anymore. Yeah. It can't be like this anymore. Right. And, you know, his, his ideas of, you know, under the sky, we are one family. Like we are one family, like yep. this notion of racial differences and, you know, gender differences and how, like we are humans together on this planet, occupying this space. We need to learn how to be with one another and stop trying to one up each other or make people wrong or make people losers right. and, you know, winner take all. And I, I say this in the book and it's, it's really, I think people find it interesting is that my father did not believe in the competition model. Mm. That yeah. competition does, does not connect us. It separates us. Right. It makes us into winners and losers. Right. Right. And, and rather than like, collaborators. Yeah. And, and so I think we've been in a competition model for, for too long and it's time to change. Yeah. I think he, he was definitely someone who obviously believed in inclusivity in all ways, yes. which is what we need yes. very, very badly now. Yeah. Yes. Very badly. Well, Shannon, I could talk to you for another several hours. Uh, but I know you don't have that time. Uh, but I so enjoyed meeting you and having this chat. It was so great. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. I really enjoyed meeting you and you know, I hope we stay in touch and have more conversations. I would love that. I would love that too. But Hey, listen, for the time being, good luck with the book. It comes out in October. And again, it's October called 6th. October 6th, be, be water. My friend, the teachings of Bruce Lee by Shannon Lee. So look out for that. And we will look out for season two of warrior and we will look mm -hmm. out for all other projects and, you know, the Bruce Lee foundation, the continuing work with that, um, that you're involved with. So keep on going, Shannon. I think it's <laughs> keep awesome. On flowing. Keep on flowing. <laughs> exactly. Your father would be extremely proud and I'm sure he is. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe my father and your father ha are having a chat right now together going, look I'm at our daughters. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sure they are. <laughs> that would be awesome. I, I love, you know what? That's a really good thought to end on. So listen, take care of yourself and uh, let's absolutely keep in touch. Yes, definitely. Take care of yourself as well. And thank okay. you so much for, right. for the chat. Uh, I told you that was a great interview and she is someone who is uh, genuine. Uh, I said that at the top of the show, I'm going to say it again, just truly authentic. And I love the fact that she is so open about continuing her journey to develop and shape her identity and the way in which it just continues to change for all of us and how we have to really continue to do a lot of self-reflection and be true to who we are and be comfortable with that, especially in light of the darkness that continues to seem to surround us in this day and age. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, those are very wise words and she clearly has learned so much from her father and continues to learn so much from, from her father. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. There's Eggy peering over as usual. Uh, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, you know, my dog, Eggy, she's always wanting to be on camera. So she knows exactly where to sit to be on camera. Look at her. Look at that little face. Okay. All right, enough of that. Thanks guys for tuning in. And as always, please uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you haven't already, the May Lee show or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and we have some new developments coming very soon that I will be talking about. Um, so stay tuned for that announcement. All right. Until then, everyone stay safe, stay healthy and stay strong. All right. Bye-bye.